Welcome! This video is a tank point of view guide for getting a gold run of the Garden of Genesis expedition at level 10 mutation. I'll provide a description of the strategy we used for the run, as well as details on the tactics and boss mob mechanics for each of the major fights. While the video is of an M10 run, this strategy will work perfectly fine with lower mutation runs, as well as with running the non-mutated Genesis expedition although some of the tactics may be overkill for those types of runs. This video is broken up into named sections, so feel free to skip this intro part and jump right into the run or to a particular fight if you're so inclined. I realize that if you're running an M10 Genesis, you certainly know where it is located, but for completeness sake, I'll point it out anyway. The Garden of Genesis expedition is located in the northwest part of Eden Grove next to the aptly named Genesis Shrine. Before jumping to the entrance though, you may want to stop by the faction representative in Valor Hold for any available faction expedition quest. There are three possible, kill archers, kill soldiers, and destroy hives. Both the archer and soldier quests should complete during a single run of Genesis, but if following the strategy I'll be outlining, the hive quest will take at least two runs unless you run back through the expedition after killing the final boss to take out the necessary hives. The mutations in effect for this Genesis run are Overgrown, Savage, and Fiendish. Since the mutations in effect can change, I'm not going to go into details on this particular set as it doesn't really affect the strategy of the run, nor the particular fight tactics. When I do mention a mutator effect, I will also label it as such so anyone watching this video to help with a regular Genesis run knows they can ignore that info. You do not need BIS gear for M10 Expedition runs, although all of your gear should be at Expertise level 625. Level 10 mutations are unforgiving if you do not meet the gear score recommendation. Ideally, you'd have Angry Earth Ward on all of your armor, but definitely not required. With the armor I'm using, I only have one piece of Angry Earth Ward, and even that is merely an epic piece. The others have ward perks applicable to other expeditions, or no ward perks at all. My goal is to eventually have legendary warded pieces applicable to all of the major enemy types, as well as with other applicable perks, but I'm still working on pulling that together. For tanks watching this, I'm running Sword and Shield with Hatchet. That is my go-to tanking combination for everything except Lazarus, where I swap the Warhammer for the Hatchet. My armor is fairly balanced with respect to physical versus elemental resistance. I prefer having everything a bit more physical resistance weighted, but this setup works for me. For the gems, I have not felt the need to slot those warding against specific elemental damage being presented by the mutation for any of the mutator runs I've done. The general elemental resistance I'm getting from the armor and the gems I'm using has worked fine so far. While you probably do want to use weapon coatings and a honing stone, they do not need to be tier 5. I'm going with tier 4 for both. I do have three major angry earth trophies up. Although you do not need major trophies for M10s, you will very likely want at least three basics. And since they are relatively cheap, no reason not to have them. Just make sure you have them up so they are giving you the damage buff. When everyone is ready, head through the veil. We are going to take out this first hive so that we have a clear spot to fight the archer that will come next. This is standard hive destruction. Get aggro and pull the fiends onto the hive so the DPS can clean everything down. The fiends all have the compost mutation on them, but ignore the healing circles that drop on death. They should all die before it matters. Watch out for the hive remnants though, as they will tick down your blight resistance. As the hive is being destroyed, anyone with a medium or longer ranged attack should tag the archer on the bridge to pull them away from the soldier, who we want to skip. Line of sight the archer so that they come through the archway. We want to keep the archer away from the soldier so we don't accidentally pull it. The tank needs to get between the archer and the soldier so that when the archer does its evade attack, it jumps away from the soldier. As you are finishing off the archer, the DPS that is going to mine the seed can break away and head down to do that while the rest of the group finishes the fight. They will take the stairs down immediately to the left through the archway. They need to stay along the left side all the way to the seed node. 
there's an archer patrolling they'll want to avoid. Wait until the archer turns and starts walking away from the seed node, then run to the node and mine it. Once they have the seed again, wait until the archer to turn away, then retrace their steps back up the stairs to join the group at the next boss. If they pick up a fiend from the hive below the stairs, they should kill it at the seed node before starting back. The rest of the group stays along the left side of the bridge to avoid the soldier and proceed to the door for the next boss room. As soon as the seed is harvested, the door will open. Ideally, the group can just go start the fight with Taxidus, and the seed miner just joins in when they get there. But if they have drawn aggro while getting the seed, you can either wait just inside the doorway and kill the mobs there, or bring them to the boss and bring them down with the boss. The tank should draw Taxidus out of the middle to get the melee DPS away from the blighted water. Taxidus will periodically draw a spear from the ground and throw it at a ranged person. He'll do a tail swipe right after that, so anyone behind him needs to block or dodge, as I carefully demonstrate the knockdown not blocking the cause. DPS should be doing heavy attacks to break his stamina. That will stun him for a bit and give you some free DPS time. He may periodically spawn a minion, but should die almost immediately from any AoE or cleave attacks on the boss. Watch out for the various mutation effects that will be going on, but normally this is a rather straightforward fight. Burn him down, collect your loot, and move on. If you are at all worried about time, skip the chest and come back for them after you've finished the last boss. Killing the last boss stops the timer and totals your final score, after which you are free to come back through the expedition to open any skipped reward chest or harvest the various crafting nodes. Make sure to activate the respawn point. And note, for all mutation runs, if anyone in the group goes down but is not actually killed, if they can, they should run to the nearest respawn point and touch the crystal. That will reset their state, so if they go down again, they can again be rezzed rather than dying. And it will not count as a death with respect to the score multiplier. Note, nothing visually happens upon touching this crystal, so just trust that the reset worked. Next, we have another archer. Use the same technique as before. Range person tags and line of sights them up the stairs. Ideally better than we did here. Tank runs around them gains aggro so their evade takes them further away from the upcoming mobs and kill it. Now hug the right to avoid the hive fiends off to the left and run to the two fiends in the bushes. Tank grabs their aggro while ranged DPS tags the group of fiends that are over behind the next elite, Gorgerai. Tagging one will pull them all. Tank grabs their aggro as they run up to the group. Ideally, get everything pulled around the bushes so Gorgerai doesn't aggro, but if he does, just beware of his ranged attacks while burning down the fiends. Now move on to Gorgirai. He'll have the promotion level mutators on him, so watch for those. The main attacks to watch for are his Staff Slam, which will do a hard-hitting circular AoE around him, and his Light Beam attack, which shoots straight line beam of light at whomever has aggro, hopefully the tank. Note, range should ensure they do not stand behind the tank as the light beam attack will shoot right through the tank and can hit them hard. Once Gorgirai is dead, make sure the person that mined the seed goes to the altar in the back right of Gorgirai's area to purify it. The rest of the group proceeds to the next area and gets started clearing the fiend and the soldier.
When the soldier is almost finished, the seed bearer should plant the seed in the small glowing circular area to get the next fight started. The goal of the next fight is to protect the tree. There will be three waves that must be defeated with all of the mobs initially aggroed on the tree. DPS should try to tag the mobs as they spawn to break their aggro from the tree. When the mobs get near the tree, the tank taunts them and pulls them away so the tree isn't damaged by any of their cleave or AoE attacks. DPS must not get between the tank and the tree or do anything that roots the mobs anywhere near the tree. Let the tank draw them off the tree and then DPS them down. Sometimes the timing of the spawns are spread out so the tank must be careful with his taunt timing to ensure he can get all of the mobs off the tree. Try not to go anywhere to the right of the arena. There are a couple of starter mobs, a soldier and an archer, over there that we've ignored and want them to continue to ignore us. The waves will consist of a soldier, prowler, and three fiends, and then a soldier, archer, and several more fiends, and finally a soldier, prowler, archer, and several more fiends. The priority for the DPS should be the Prowler. They die quickly, the Archer, and finally the Soldier. Ideally, the Fiends just die to the Cleave, but finish them off as opportunity presents. Provided the tree is being left alone, it is easiest on the healer if the DPS all concentrate on the current priority target, rather than spreading themselves around. Kill the priority target and then move to the next priority. The tank should hold the soldier off to the side of the fights, keeping him facing away from the main group as he does a path of destiny which can kill someone that doesn't see it coming. Keep him far enough away that his sundering shockwave doesn't hurt anyone either. And by the way, its AoE is bigger than the animation appears, so make sure you have him far enough away that it isn't going to catch an unwary DPS. The third wave seems to be the time when the starter soldier over to the right is most likely to get accidentally pulled. If that happens, the tank should just grab his aggro and hold him with the other soldier until the DPS gets to them. Once everything is dead, one of the DPS should grab the branch from the tree, and then we proceed. If you're collecting the chest, watch out for the fiend near the chest if it did not get killed in the battle. We're skipping the hive that is to the left at the bottom of the steps, so stay to the right and cross directly to the huge tree. Don't go too far right as there is a mob over there that we don't want to aggro. Hug the tree around clockwise, continuing to stay to the right until around the next tree and into the clearing. Ideally, you've bypassed the hive and the soldier that were off to the left. Although if someone got sloppy about staying to the right, as happened to us, you may pick up some of those mobs. If so, try to bring them down before attracting Taxel's attention. If luck really is not with you and Taxel joins in, just stack them up being careful if the soldier is still up so he and Taxo don't stagger you into a 1-2 dead punch sequence. Taxo is your standard brute type elite mob. The DPS should heavy attack to break his stamina and cause him to kneel while ranged players should be ready to avoid when he does his ranged spear attack. He'll have the promotion and mutation level mutator effects that you'll need to deal with. Once Taxel is down, we're going to just run past the Shaman. He'll throw some ranged attacks, but will not follow. Also going to skip the soldier that comes next. Hug the left all the way past him, but beware the gap in the bridge just beyond him so you don't fall. The tank should grab aggro on the archer as you run past, but everyone else should ignore him. 
Just run into the area to the left of the crystal and line of sight the archer while starting to burn down the two fiends. But make sure to activate the crystal as you pass, just in case. Once the archer comes around the corner, the tank should go around him, so his evade will jump him further away from the platform edge, making it easier for the DPS so they don't have to worry about falling off accidentally. For anyone watching just running a regular Genesis, the vined over wall that is to the left of where the archer is killed is actually a passage to a room containing two named elites that usually drop loot bags. So you'll likely want to kill them after we've turned the collected branch into a torch in a little while. For this mutated run, we do not need them for the score, so we'll be skipping them to save time. Now on to Alluvium Marl, the Caretaker. The Caretaker has various attacks. A light attack, which is a one-handed swipe. Heavy attack, which is a two-handed pound. Block it since it will stun you. A ranged vine throw that should be blocked or dodged. He'll spawn an insect swarm that will follow the target and do damage over time. And finally, the most dangerous, a big wave attack that will send a wave out in a rectangular shape across the room. This must be dodged as it'll knock you down and usually kill whomever it hits. He'll start doing the swarm in the wave after creating the first bramble wall. During this initial phase, if you have a lot of ranged DPS, you may want to try to pull the caretaker off to the side of the arena. This will give the DPS a few extra moments to damage him when he runs back to the middle for the bramble wall phase, which he'll do about two thirds health. When he reaches the middle, he'll put up the bramble wall. We are going to do the one then all method for this. When the caretaker puts up the bramble wall the first time, only the tank will go in. Everyone else stay out and kill the four sets of mobs that will spawn every 90 degrees around the bramble wall. On the second wall phase, everyone will go in to finish off the caretaker. The spawned mobs will disappear when the caretaker dies. The bramble wall phase has a white mechanic that the tank must deal with. A second or so after the bramble wall has been erected, the caretaker will gain a stamina bar and begin generating a glowing orb, which he will plunge into the ground and then jump into the air to smash. If that happens, everyone dies. You have about eight seconds to break his stamina to prevent it. Be sure you have enough strength and be using a weapon with a high enough stamina damage to accomplish this. With my 261 strength, it takes four heavy sword attacks, which leaves about two seconds to spare. Make sure you start breaking the stamina as soon as you can. Once you've broken his stamina, he'll do an insect swarm on you. I usually pop a regen potion to help mitigate the damage. And ideally, if you have a good healer, which I fortunately do, they'll drop the sacred ground for you to use. I will also move around the caretaker as much as possible to get out of the swarm. If he's in the middle area, I'll just rotate completely around him. And if he's on the side, which he usually goes to, I'll move back and forth next to him. Try to stay next to him though. If you're not, he will likely throw his wave attack at you and there's very little room to dodge within the corral. My deaths during this phase are all from getting sloppy and catching the wave in a very bad way. After preventing the white mechanic, your job is to survive and do what damage you safely can. After a while, the bramble wall will drop. Ideally, the rest of the team has killed all of the mobs that have spawned outside, but more likely a few remain. I generally just pull the caretaker a ways away from the action and hold him while the group finishes off the remaining mobs. You can try to help by grabbing the remaining mobs, but that can be dangerous. It can pull you away from the caretaker, which opens you up to a wave attack, and the mobs do significant stamina damage, so you will have trouble maintaining block. Note, as I tried to pull the caretaker away from the group, I got a bit far from him and he threw a wave at me. But too often, the series of mob spawns glitches such that they are delayed, and they all spawn shortly before the bramble wall falls. In this case, you will need to help out by aggroing as many as you can and kiting them around. You will not be able to hold position and block. There are several mobs with ranged attacks, so you'll want to run in an arc forcing deflection aiming, which the AI doesn't do very well, to avoid these attacks. If you're hit, it'll stagger you out of running and the melee mobs will catch you, often resulting in a deadly outcome. Fortunately, we did not have this issue on this run. Once he is at one third health, he'll run back to the middle for the second bramble wall phase. Everyone runs into the middle for this one. He will again do his white mechanic, Breaking stamina should be easy with everyone there, but just make sure that it happens since the DPS may not be aware of the deed. Next, he will go into a diving phase, where he dives under the water and jumps out at one of the group. 
They should dodge or block that attack. He will leave a path of glowing water wherever he swims. Try to avoid it as it will inflict blight. While he is diving, one person should begin damaging the Genesis Cat Mushroom until it is one hit away from destruction. I've heard many things about what it does. Wrong answers are that it must be destroyed or you wipe, or that it causes additional insect swarms. Neither of those are true. Possible answers are that it provides an empower buff, either to the one that destroyed it or to the entire group. I have not been able to identify receiving a buff, but I'm at the one that destroys it, so I'm leaning toward the destroyer getting the buff. Anyway, destroying it doesn't seem to hurt, so have your highest DPS destroy it as the boss comes out of his dive phase for a possible empowerment. After six dives, the caretaker will reappear and everyone should begin DPSing him. It is now a DPS race. Kill the caretaker before the wall falls and you are swarmed by all the angry mobs. Ideally, everyone, ranged included, should stack on the boss or he might do his wave attack. But if the ranged are in light armor, they may have to risk the wave or be one shot by the boss's cleave. Once the caretaker dies, all of the remaining mobs should despawn. Note, if you have issues killing the boss during the all-in phase, you can just repeat the tank-only method for the second bramble wall. After the wall disappears and the spawned mobs are dispatched, it should be easy to finish off the caretaker. Anyone that has died during this fight should run back to the previous checkpoint crystal and reset their death count so the next downing doesn't result in an instant death. There is a lot of fighting before another checkpoint crystal becomes available. Obviously, I forgot to do that, so do what I say and not what I do. It is easy to get blighted during the final fight, so you'll want to have a blight potion available. Ideally on your fast access bar, but at least in inventory. No, my downing was definitely my fault and not the healer. I was blighted and didn't have the pot easily available. The next fight is currently glitched, so I'll describe what you should do. A DPS lights the branch in the brazier and uses it to burn the vines blocking the end of the room. Once the vines are burned, the DPS can do a weapon swap to drop the torch so they can help fight. Everyone stays in the brazier room. We do not need to kill the hive and only want the named elite, Circe's. Normally, the healer or ranged DPS would tag Circe's to draw him to us where the tank grabs aggro and the DPS burns him down in the brazier room. Due to a glitch, Circe just stays at the bottom of the stairs, so we need to go to him. Fortunately, the hive beans don't move much either, so ignore them and stack on Circe's to burn him down. If he resets, just keep attacking until he's finally dead. Then move back through the brazier room where a ranged person grabs Agron Kotomos, who spawned out in the middle of the caretaker's arena. Try to line of sight him into the room so we can fight him without drawing in any of the minor mobs that have spawned. Kotomos is a prowler and thus doesn't stay in one place too long. Having him in the brazier room doesn't give him much room to run around. To help contain him, the tank needs to grab aggro and stay between Kotomos and the caretaker's arena. Just like the archers, prowlers will usually take off away from whomever has aggro. With Kotomos dead, a DPS needs to relight the branch in the brazier and move on to the vine blockage to the left. We are skipping the room back by the archer we fought before the caretaker's arena since we do not need those two named elites for the score and want to save some time. Stay along the wall to avoid the mobs scattered around the arena. We want to avoid the soldier just past the vines, so stay to the right. The tank must make sure the soldier does not aggro on the torchbearer since he is defenseless. If that happens, taunt the soldier so the torchbearer can proceed. Everyone stays right and goes up the stairs. Ideally, the hive fiends ignore you, but if one aggros, the tank should pick them up. It is very likely the archer at the top of the stairs will aggro on the group. If that happens, same thing. Tank gets aggro while the group proceeds across the bridge and down the other stairs. Hop off the broken stairs onto the rubble at the bottom. Be careful not to land too far to the right as you will become stuck. If that happens, just unstuck and try again. This goes for the torch bearer as well. Fortunately, they should still have the torch after doing unstuck. Ideally, after a few seconds, any mobs aggroed on the group would de-aggro and leave. 
but often the archer would just run down the stairs on the other side of the area and attack. If that happens, Tink runs around the archer to get it to jump back toward the rubble and away from the hives, and the DPS kills it. During these next fights, everyone needs to stay near the water to avoid the hives that are back toward the bridge. Next, have a ranged person pull the prowler and fiend across the water for the DPS to burn down. Repeat for the soldier. Note, if you're running short on time, you can pull the fiend, prowler, and soldier at the same time. We do them separately because we're good on time and it reduces the death risk. Finally, the tank runs across the water to pull Oldus, ideally to the front left part of the peninsula. The torchbearer can go along the right side to burn down the vines and go light the brazier, trying to avoid the patrolling archer. The tank should keep Oldus as far to the left as possible without endangering themselves in the blighted water. The torchbearer should hug the left wall once through the vines. This reduces the risk that Odus will target the torchbearer with his spear throw attack, which would likely kill the torchbearer since they can't block or dodge. And if they die, someone has to run back through all the mobs we skip to light a new branch. Odus is a standard brute like those we've already faced, so deal with his attacks and burn him down. If the patrolling archer is still up, you can either pull him into the corridor and kill him, or just wait until he passes the entrance and run behind him. Grab the chest and jump over the railing. Note, if you're running short on time, skip the chest, since we're right by another chest we're going to be skipping anyway, so coming back after we're done is not much of a hassle. We want to deal with the archer and a couple of fiends before engaging the soldier that's off to the right, so stay left of center to avoid him. The tank needs to get between the archer and soldier, so the archer will evade back toward the corner away from the soldier. Stack the fiends on the archer and burn them all down. Once the archer is dead, the next door will open. We do need one more name delete and thus need to kill the soldier we just get. So a ranged DPS should tag them while everyone runs into the next room as we want to do the fight next to the respawn crystal. Then if anyone happens to go down they can reset the death immediately so we don't take a chance of hurting the mutation score multiplier. Note there is a chest back where the soldier was patrolling, get it after we're done. Now on to the final fight. As you enter the arena, stay near the edge until everyone is across the vine bridge. Otherwise, you may start the fight early, which will result in the vine bridge disappearing and killing anyone still on it, or at least trapping the dawdlers outside the arena. Note the stone circle that is about half the size of the arena. This landmark is useful when dealing with the boulders that will be described later. When ready, proceed to the middle. The Blight Greenskeeper will always spawn in the middle square. While she is in melee mode, she will not move, so the tank just grabs her aggro and keeps her facing away from the rest of the group. She has a variety of attacks. Single hand light attack swipes that can be blocked. She will spawn a couple of big poison orbs that will roll around her in a counterclockwise spiral, leaving poison circles on the ground. Avoid the balls and the circles until the poison disappears. That lasts about 20 seconds from when the orbs appeared. A heavy attack where she rears back and extends herself with a forward slam. This must be dodged or it will stun you, even throw a block. Note, she sometimes would do these back to back so be ready to avoid multiple strikes. A conal stream that is best dodged or run out of, 
mainly a concern for ranged players. Occasionally, she will target the furthest person with a green particle beam that is channeling a large poison circle. The person with the beam must run to the edge of the area to get the poison circle that is about to drop out of the way, and then get out of the circle ASAP. The poison dot really hurts. The channeling phase lasts for 5 seconds, while the resulting poison circle lasts for 25 to 30 seconds. At about 2 thirds health, she will spawn two blighted dryads and then burrow through the ground attempting to pop up under someone. You can see where she is burrowing, so just avoid her pop-ups. And if you have ranged attack, get one in when she does that pop-up. The tank should stack the two dryad adds and the DPS burn them down. They go down rather quickly. After a variable number of dives, she'll pop back up and continue her stationary fight. As she approaches 50% health, she will begin throwing boulders around the arena. She will turn and face a ranged player and start conjuring a boulder in her hand, which takes two seconds before she throws it. A dotted white circle will appear where the boulder is to land. The targeted person should dodge out of the way or take damage and be knocked to the ground. These boulders are critical to avoiding the white mechanic that will soon happen. Remember the stone circle I mentioned when entering the arena? The ranged player should try to get at least one of the boulders dropped on it as that will ensure everyone has a safe spot they can run and hide behind. If the boulders drop too close to the arena edge, you cannot get behind them and they are worthless to you. If she targets someone with the channeling poison circle, they must not drop it near a well-placed boulder as that would prevent you from using it during the white phase. Shortly after dropping four boulders, she will go into the white phase usually when she breaches 50% health, or a bit lower if you've got really good DPS. She'll stand up tall and begin channeling the wipe. The entire arena will fill with a green haze about one meter off the floor. Everyone must get completely behind a boulder. After eight seconds, she'll throw her hands down and cause the haze to explode, destroying the boulders and killing anyone not behind one. Note, I switched to Hatchet when she starts channeling since the Defy Death passive has worked to keep the wielder alive if they don't make it behind a boulder. This could be patched out at some point, so don't count on it, but it doesn't hurt to switch just in case you don't make it to safety and it's still working. Note, if someone has died and been kicked from the arena, she may target them for a boulder if they've run back toward their entrance in order to watch the fight. This is not good as it is one less possible safe spot for those remaining. Usually not an issue for the first wipe phase, but can be in subsequent ones where she will drop fewer boulders. The rest of the fight is a repeat of what's happened so far, except she will usually only drop two boulders before doing subsequent wipe phases. Finish her off and collect your loot. You need a score of 40,000 or higher in order to gold a mutator run. With this strategy, we managed that with some despair. The strategy does forego the normal enemy's killed multiplier in order to save time, so it is required that you make the run in under 35 minutes, kill the eight named elite shown, and have fewer than three respawn deaths. Hence the importance of going back to the respawn crystals if you have been down during a fight. Finally, no wipes, which satisfying the respawn death requirement ensures. Remember to go back and collect any chests you've skipped along the way. If you happen to have the Hive Destruction Faction Quest, you can go finish off the hives we skipped to complete that, or just progress the quest on subsequent runs. Thanks for watching. I hope you have found some of this information useful and that it aids you in successful Garden of Genesis runs.